I love to talk about energy, and I love to talk usually when I stand up and walk around and gesture, but I cannot do it here because there is this thing in the middle. So if I'll be here, these people will not see me, if I'll be there. Um, anyway, this is an impossible task, uh, 30 minutes and to cover so many things. Um, I don't like to show these PowerPoint pictures, but I have them here so they would keep me organized because energy is such a complex thing that you start with one thing and before too long you run away onto something else. Here I go click, 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 and this will keep me more or less to my time because otherwise I would run away with the first topic and would start talking about old Chinese history before too long and we don't want to hear that. Uh, I prepared a series of pictures which are unusual in many ways, but which tell the story in a very sort of graphic fashion. This one is the story of civilization. As you see, the line, the black line, the fossil fuels and primary electricity, that is nuclear electricity and hydroelectricity, this has been rising exponentially since 1800. Notice, please, that the left axis, the y-axis, is a logarithmic axis, right? So it's tenfold and tenfold. So as you see, we've made these two orders of magnitude jumps from less than zero, one to nearly 10 and over 10, and we are still rising. This is the destiny of mankind. We don't know how to stop. We stop with everything else. If you would eat 5,000 kilocalories of energy per day, all of us would be like balloons. We stopped. We stopped drinking level. We stop even with cars. We make some very powerful cars, big Mercedes, but we stop. Usually people don't drive cars which have 10,000 horsepower. But collectively, globally, we cannot stop. This still keeps going on and on, on and on. Notice also that the biomass energy, wood and charcoal, they haven't stopped. They still are going up in places like Brazil, India, China, at a much lower level, but still going up. So we are caught in this endless cycle of more and more and more, and it's not a linear cycle, it's exponential, just increasing, increasing very rapidly. Now, the, this is a Spanish situation, which is one of the more remarkable ones. Spain is a remarkable country in many ways. I always tell people things which they don't know about Spain. My American friends don't realize that you people eat more meat than Germans do now. Okay? This is something which people say, Mediterranean diet, they eat no meat, just vegetables and some red wine, right? <laughs> no, German consumption is now 70, you see, I'm running away from it, but this is interesting. <laughs> Germans, Germans eat 70 kilograms, eat 70 kilograms of meat a year. You people are over 100 kilograms now. This is the benefits of EU. This is one of the benefits of EU as well. You are increasing your energy consumption faster than just about anybody else in rich countries. Okay. You see that line is rising, rising, rising. Now the left axis is not exponential, but it's going very rapidly. Let's put it this way. In 1950, Spain was consuming less energy per capita than China is consuming today. Okay. Less in 1950 than China today. Now you are basically at a French level. Not quite, but very close to French level. Very close to German level as well. Okay. Very close. And as you see, it's been rising recently. The TPS total primary supply rising very, very steeply. Right? Now, the problem is with this that uh, it's a good thing, but at the same time, it's a bad thing. As we increase our energy consumption, what we call the intensity of the energy consumption, how much we need per unit of gross domestic product has been going down. You see, very rapidly in the US, Canada, UK. So our economies are becoming more efficient. More dollar for less energy. Okay? Less energy for GDP dollar. As you see, the Japanese case is not like that. Japan was always pretty efficient, and you know, there is no definite trend. I have Spanish data from 1950, and I could have shown you Spanish data, but they would have been just at the bottom in the lower right corner. Spanish energy intensity is unfortunately not like the American or Canadian. It's not coming down because you people, the economy is growing, but you are still increasing your energy too rapidly. So your intensity is basically the same. Your intensity, in spite of the large increase of energy consumption since 1950, your energy intensity, how many units of how many joules per hour, hasn't changed much since 1950. Remains basically up and down, bobbing, but basically level. So you still have to enter the stage of 
decreasing energy intensity. You are not there yet. So in that sense, Spain hasn't been fully modernized yet because Spain is still in that stage, nor has Japan. You say, why Japan? Because they still consume too little in their households. The housing condition in Japan compared to housing condition in US and Canada are appalling. Apartments are too small, badly heated, so on and so on. So Japan still has to make that step, and uh, Spain has to make that step in some other ways. Now, these two graphs are graphs which are the most frightening of the collection I am showing you because they show what's to come. If you look at the left graph, which is the Lorentz curve, which shows the inequality of distribution. You can plot the income, you can plot the longevity. Here I am plotting the total population versus energy consumption. You see that frightening result that 10% of people are consuming 40% of the world energy. We can go even lower and look that 5% of people, that is the United States, are consuming 25% of the world energy. Okay? And of course, we can turn it around, and you can, we can see that among the poorest people, actually, this graph doesn't catch it, because this graph shows only the consumption of commercial energy, coal, oil, natural gas, and prime electricity. There is about one billion people in the world who are not consuming any of these energies. They are just consuming wood and straw and charcoal. So we have this immense inequality in energy distribution where three quarters of all energy are consumed by about 20% of people and where 10% of the people are actually 30% of the people don't consume any of these energies and 10% consume less than 5% of all these commercial energies. The graph on the right side shows the frequency distribution by the number of countries. The arrow points where Spain was in 1950. That's where China is today. That much energy per capita China is consuming today. Okay? As you see, much less in equivalent energy, much less than one ton of oil per capita. Uh, there you see where Spain is today, at about three and a half tons of oil per capita. And then it goes on and on uh, to these much, much higher levels. Now, why this graph is frightening is when you start asking yourself this question, what will happen once that one billion people who don't consume any oil, coal, and gas will start consuming some of it? And once the people who are consuming less than one ton of oil will start consuming three and a half tons of oil, like Spain does, four tons of oil, or four and a half, like Germany does, or eight tons of oil, God forbid, as Canada and US does. Clearly, that situation will be impossible. There is not enough oil and natural, there is enough coal in the world, but I'll get into it in a sec. We don't want to burn that coal because coal is 80% carbon, and you burn that coal and the pure carbon dioxide is rising to the sky, so we don't want to do that. But there is not enough oil, there is not enough gas for these countries, poor countries, who are on the left side of this graph to join the rich countries. So this is one of the greatest instability causes in the world politics and world economy, that you have this huge inequality of energy distribution. And there is nothing we can do about it very rapidly. Think of it again, that it took Spain 50 years to travel that road from less than one ton to these three and a half tons and to be basically at the French level. So this energy transition never happened in a hurry. So China now is close to one ton. It will take China another probably 30, 40 years to get to about two tons. So these are very long-term propositions and they happen very, very slowly. So we will be living with this inequality for a long time. This is another thing which is absolutely critical. And this is not going to change my any new discoveries. This is the figure for 2000, and I didn't do a new one for 2005 because the total area of these countries which I'm showing wouldn't have changed at all. This is what we have to live with. 75% of known oil reserves are in the Middle East. The countries of the world here are shaped and sized according to their oil reserves. And as you see, Europe disappears. Europe will fit easily into about 15% of Iraq, right, in terms of oil uh, reserves, right? And there you see the world is dominated by Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, right? Even North America, although the U.S. is the world's second largest producer of oil still, but in terms of reserves, it's very little. And 
We in Canada, we say we have more oil than Saudi Arabia, but it's a different oil because it's oil in oil sands. It's not the liquid oil. And this shows the liquid oil only. So in terms of liquid oil, we are just like a very small fraction of Kuwait, which is a very tiny country. This is the destiny of the world. God or evolution decided in its eternal wisdom to place 75% of crude oil into Persian Gulf area, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. Nothing will change in the future. We will discover more oil in Angola, Siberia, Northern Canada, offshore. We will discover. But what it will do that the Middle East maybe will go from 70 to 62%, right? That's all, right? The discoveries outside of the Middle East will not change this basic picture. They may reduce the area by 10 or 15%, but basically this will remain with us. So this will determine the world oil prices, the world geopolitics, the world energy situation for the rest of this century. There is nothing we can do about that as well. Okay? Now, fortunately, there is good news, though. We are not running, in spite of what you might have heard about peak oil, we are not running out of this oil fast. Actually, we are not running out of oil. You know, the running out is an economic concept, how much you are willing to pay for it. Geologically speaking, we are not running out of oil, physically speaking. Until recently, typical rate of recovery, when I said, I am done, I am leaving this oil field, I am finished, 70% of oil remained in that oil field. We typically recovered 30% of oil, and then it was too difficult, too un uneconomical to re recover remaining 70. Now, with better techniques, secondary and tertiary recovery, we get 35, 40, 45, in some fields almost 50%, but we still walk away from 50% of oil. So even when we say no oil, there will still be about half of the oil which we ever discovered in the ground. So from physical, geological, scientific point of view, you cannot run out of oil. You run out of it economically. Right? However, as these graphs show, we don't know how rapidly we'll be discovering it in the future because so much remains to be undiscovered. I always tell people, come to me and talk to me about peak oil when Angola, uh, Gulf of Guinea, Sudan, Nigeria, Siberia, most of the Middle East, when these places will be drilled with the intensity with which Texas and California have been drilled, where basically every square kilometer there is a well or two wells. There are areas of Siberia, size of Spain, there is not a single well, right? A lot more oil remains to be discovered. So this is why these three color curves, the peak may come 2020, 2030, 2040, and so on. I could have drawn more curves. And this is for the liquid oil. But we already are removing the distinction between the classical conventional liquid oil and the non-conventional oil. The biggest oil investment in the world today is not in Saudi Arabia, is not in Kuwait, is not in Nigeria. It's in Alberta in Canada. $60 billion were invested in past 18 months into oil sands in Canada. It's a difficult oil to get out. I just have to mine it and then to squeeze that oil out of it and dump the 95% on the site and get 5% out of it. Or you have to heat tremendous amount of steam, inject that steam underground, loosen that oil, and then pump it out, which means that you are using huge amount of natural gas to produce crude oil. So it's not actually a crude oil production, it's an exchange of natural gas for oil. You end up with little positive, right? But still, it requires tremendous amount of uh, natural gas. However, the advantage is this, it's true. The oil sands of Alberta contain more oil than classical oil fields of Saudi Arabia. But it's expensive, difficult to get out. But with prices at $60, $70, people have been willing to invest uh, $60 billion into that. The amount of non-conventional in the world, in Canada, in Venezuela, inside, it's immense, absolutely immense. So the physical question of running out doesn't enter. It's the question of price. The marginal cost is the running out of oil, not the physical thing. But as you see, even for liquid oil, when you next time read liquid oil peak 2010, 2012, maybe we will decide that we are not willing to pay more than $80, right? But if we are willing to pay 100, $150 of oil, 
the liquid oil will flow 50 years from now okay, if you are willing to pay the price because it is in the ground. So in that sense, it's good news. However, don't ever try, don't ever try when you see this graph to forecast the price of crude oil. This shows you the prices of crude oil from 1981 to 2005, right? So you see, you would be about as successful as a child with a crayon. You take that crayon and you do this, right? And this is the oil prices, right? You never can get it right. Everybody, as you know, every company has a chief economist. Every organization is the chief forecaster. And that's what they do 24 hours a day, forecast these prices, right? And they get them wrong next morning they are wrong, not <laughs> next week or two, next morning they are wrong. So you cannot do this. Just remember this graph when they ask you, you know, and you see the latest report, International Energy Agency, you know, the World Economic Forum, right? United Nations. Just throw it into the waste, no, not recycle the paper, not so <laughs> recycle the paper, because that's what it is, okay? So no peak oil, but no ability to say what the oil prices will be. Don't forget, this August and September, in three weeks, we went down 30% with oil oil price. In three weeks, 30% down, right? Nobody would have forecast that even in July, right? That in three months, we'll go 30% down. Bad news, so there was good news, I don't know. You can't forecast, I think it's good news actually. It's, life is interesting that way. You don't know what will happen. This is bad news. Europe particularly is high on renewables. Europe seems to be like a teenage who's been smoking something too much and has this idea of losing renewables will save us. This is a very sobering graph. You look at the consumption in the world, that's the red one, global fossil fuel consumption year 2000. <laughs> Because the bottom scale is logarithmic, it will be the same thing for 2005. Just say, so you know, little smidgen adding to it. You see that even if you deploy some underwater turbines and capture all ocean currents, it's five orders of magnitude less. Five orders of magnitude, right? Okay, that's tens of thousands, uh, that's hundreds of thousands times less than we need today. Okay, so ocean currents are not going to save us. We capture every tide, which is not very good because there'll be no motion of tides on this planet. As you see, this is four orders of magnitude or three orders less we need. We capture all the heat coming out of the ground, which is impossible because most of the heat doesn't come out in geothermal places where it's very hot. Most of the heat comes under this floor here. You know, every hundred meters you drill underground is one degree Celsius warmer, but it's very low gradient. You cannot use it economically, even if you would. That's what you would get, right? Less than the global demand, right? So there are only two players out there in renewables which can deliver more than current global demand. And that's wind, as you see by about an order of magnitude, and that's solar by about four orders of magnitude. And wind is the big European favorite. If you look at this, justified. We have one order of magnitude more wind than we right need. So theoretically speaking, we could supply the global energy demand from wind. A little problem here. If I capture all of that wind, the global climate stops, right? There will be no global climate because global climate is going from high to low pressure, carrying the wind, carrying the precipitation. That's it. That's the global climate. So I have that choice. So in reality, so it will never happen. Besides, you all have flown enough to know that the strongest winds happen to be at eight, nine, 10, 11 kilometers above sea level. That's where it's shaking all these. The Boeing 747 is 400 tons and it still it shakes up there because it's 250 kilometer wind pummeling that plane, right? Here at the, the low, it's an exponential curve. The higher you go, the faster it goes. Can we ever build, can there be an engineer design a tower rising to 11 kilometers above ground and putting a turbine at the top of it? But the 250, besides, that wind is so strong, it would rip that turbine from the tower immediately. As you know, there is only a window for generation. Too slow, we cannot generate. Too fast, we cannot generate. Hence, the windiest area in the US is totally useless. You build all these wind turbines in the Gulf Coast, Texas, Louisiana, comes in that hurricane, and like all these drilling rigs and everything in refineries, brings them down, and that's the end of your wind generation. So we will be ever able to use only very small portion of that wide wind bar, very small portion. In windy places, 
in places where the wind is not too strong, not too weak, just right, and where it blows very frequently. So there are a few blessed places like that around the planet, and Spain has few of them. But believe me, most of the places in this world either have no wind or they have winds which are too strong. The same thing which is true about Gulf of Mexico is true about East Asia. There's lots of people in China, lots of people in Indonesia, in Vietnam. But this is a monsoonal area, rapid monsoon come, winds are simply too strong. On the other hand, there are areas which are totally windless. Where I live, we are very windy in summer, but in the middle of winter, we are so cold precisely because there's a huge high pressure cell covering Canada like a lid, and under that lid, like for these cheeses, you know, these glass lids, there we see that there is no wind at all in January, so we can't generate. So the only thing which is good is solar radiation. What we need is what? To discover the method of cheap, large scale, massive, give it away to people for a voltaic electricity generation. Once we get it, we can use that electricity to do what? Well, to dissociate water and produce hydrogen. Then you can have your hydrogen car, right? We can do everything and anything if we will have very cheap photovoltaics. The resource is not a problem, okay? So what we need, if I would be running, I made a speech to uh, the OECD ministers in May in Paris about the uh, priorities of funding. There is no debate. There is no debate about priorities. If I have a $100, I would put $90 into photovoltaics, okay? not into fusion, because fusion may be like 2250 you know, and ITER project will cost us $12 billion and nothing to show for it, so I would go for this one. Okay? The bad news about all of this is there is this huge mismatch, except again for photovoltaic, which is very high. What we can do with fossil fuels, we can capture them at very high power densities. You need very small areas to produce coal, oil, natural gas. These are these blue things on the top. On the other hand, you see the biomass, phytomass at the bottom. This is very low energy density. You need huge, huge areas. Let me give you just one simple calculation. The U.S. is now pouring billions of dollars into corn ethanol. Right? If the U.S. wants to run all of its cars on corn ethanol, it needs three times its area in agricultural land to produce that. That's a non-starter, really, right? Moreover, there is this problem between production and consumption. And there you can see only photovoltaics is good. Only photovoltaics already with today's efficiency, I can capture with the same density I need for my house. So theoretically speaking, if money is not a problem today because it's too expensive, I can buy photovoltaic cells, put them on the roof of my house, and they will be enough to power my house because the energy consumption per square meter of my house is pretty much the same like energy production from photovoltaics. Right? But as you see, if I decide to run my house on Biomass energy, say, I will plant corn, convert corn into ethanol, and burn ethanol in the furnace to heat my house. I will need uh, about uh, 100 times the area of my house to produce that ethanol. That's a non-starter again, really. So we have to take this mismatch into account. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for Asia. For individual houses, if I have cheap photovoltaics, the roof of the house, enough. But look at the high rises. Go to Hong Kong and Shanghai and see the future of mankind. 30, 40, 50 stories high rises when you can reach the other window from your window, right, next to each other. Because you have to house 3 billion people in the next 40 years. You see their consumption, right? That's about at a 1 kilowatt per square meter, 1,000 watts per square meter, because there are 30, 40 stories of these people up. And this is a power density much, much higher than any renewable energy can deliver. So again, we will need huge areas of these renewable energies out there. So that's another bad news. This is why we haven't progressed so far, as you see. The renewables globally supply about 21% of electricity, okay? And nuclear about 16. But as you see, most of that is classical hydro, the big dams, right? On that little corner is the new renewables, and of these is wind, very little solar and some geotherm, right? So look at this picture on the left. How small is that square in that lower right corner? These are the new renewables, right? This is the realistic figure, right? It's a very, very small percentage, right? Now I will end up with good news. The good news is that we don't have to consume 
five or six or eight tons of oil as people are consuming in the US and Canada. This kind of shows you that if you are Afghanistan, you must consume more because you are miserable. Children are dying, people are living, you know, not beyond 40, there is no economy, it's horrible. As I increase my energy consumption, by the time I reach, I reach about, uh, about uh, one ton of oil equivalent per capita, uh, the things start bending. That is, I am gaining less and less of what is good to gain. In this case, the infant mortality. As you see, by the time I reach about two and a half tons, I am not gaining anything anymore. That is, at two and a half tons, or Spain at three and a half tons, or Japan at close to five tons, or US at eight tons, the same infant mortality. I could show you this graph for basically every quality of life measure. There is this graph for life expectancy, which is the same the other way around. Once you reach about two tons of oil per capita, there is no improvement. So you see, there is this challenge. We could design a society, global society, say about two tons of oil per capita, where kids could have all good education, everybody would live to 70, women to 80, where children would be dying young, where people would be nicely employed, no mass unemployment, where economies would be good and productive, because after that, everything is just basically frivolous consumptions, bigger houses, bigger cars, more flying to different places. You don't have to fly for your next vacation to Mauritius to be happy, really, right? You don't have to gamble every two weeks, right? Maybe you can gamble every two years once, really, right? So <laughs> these graphs are graphs which are actually very hopeful because they, they see that, yes, half a ton, one ton, that's a miserable life, right? But at two tons, and don't forget, it doesn't even have to be two tons 50 years from now because we are improving our energy efficiency. Remember those graphs for US, Canada, right? We are improving our energy intensity. So maybe 50 years from now, we could do the same trick with one and a half tons or one tons. So it's doable. It's possible to have a decent society without that first curve, that consumption forever, forever rising. So there is hope for us, but we have to do something about it not just having conferences and meetings and publishing papers, actually do something about this. And I'm afraid we will not do anything about it unless and until we are forced by high prices, by runaway global warming, by some total blow up in the Middle East, something will have to force us. Because on our own, we are not willing to say, okay, today is Thursday, we'll start doing something about it Monday. We cannot master the, you know, the attention, the uh, it's almost a compulsion, the concentration, the determination to do so. But we will need it if we will have to do something about it. Thank you.